welcome back to another episode of the Tech Hub sponsored by IPS. Uh, my name is Carter. A couple weeks ago, I got to hop on a video call with Kyle Kewen from Resi Streaming, um, and he was able to just talk through their solution. And honestly, it's very exciting, and we're really pumped for you all to get to join in on this conversation with us. Well, Kyle, thanks so much for joining us today. Uh, really excited to hear a little bit more about Resi and what all you have to offer. Um, so, if you'll just kind of talk to me you know, top level, 50,000 foot view, kind of what are some problems people run into in regards to streaming? Sure, yeah, so when you're streaming, some of the biggest challenges you encounter is that you have to use a public internet, right? So some organizations are, are luckily enough or are, are, are resourced enough that they can pay for their own dedicated connections um, between locations uh, and dedicated internet connection. But even with that, you still have switches that are connection points between you and your user. And that can be up to 20 different connection points between you and your user. But for the rest of us, we're all gonna be using the public internet. And the problem with the public internet is that it's unpredictable. What type of connection you're gonna have that day, what type of speed you're gonna get, uh, whether your internet provider is gonna go down or not. So all these variables leave uh, a lot of room for inconsistent uh, stream quality because when you're streaming you're sending data across the internet as you lose connection you lose that data and that data can't be uh, regained uh, and then you that's what results in buffering and pixelation and all of those issues and so that's one of the core things that organizations struggle with when trying to stream today uh, the other issues would be the ability to stream to multiple destinations simultaneously uh, and the ab ability to stream uh, with a manageable size team Right, finding tools that can do all of the heavy lifting for you so you can focus on your production. Yeah, so obviously, I mean, it sounds like what you're describing is something everyone's gonna deal with. It's a pretty universal issue. Um, so how does then Resi you know, deal with that and, and kind of challenge that? Absolutely, so Resi uh, created a technology that assumes the internet is going to be unreliable. Right, so we've created a technology that, that can send the live stream uh, from, uh, I'm sorry, the technology we created can correct for uh, the data loss that you would experience if the internet has trouble with connection. So basically the, what Resi provides is a technology that sends your data from an encoder to our cloud. And then in our cloud, there's a 90 second delay uh, during which we can resend data. And so now we're resending any data that got dropped during that 90 seconds um, and perfecting your broadcast and making sure that your content is 100% uh, frame by frame accurate, all of your data, which means that your users never get a buffering wheel and your users never have poor quality and the stream never drops. So it's basically bulletproof streaming by leveraging time. We leverage time and corrective technology to make sure your stream is always perfect. You can even survive a 90 second outage. Uh, literally someone unplugs the internet for 90 seconds and still maintain a perfect broadcast. The second thing that Resi really does that helps organizations is we streamline your efforts. So everything is scheduled and automated. You can set up your broadcast to go live Friday at 6 p.m. and you just have to make sure the content's going in when you said it would be and you don't have to press play, you don't have to press stream, you don't have to mess with stream keys or codes. It's all gonna go uh, automatically. Yeah, so it sounds like maybe you've touched on this a little bit, um, but you know when you kind of look into Resi and all that, it talks a lot about this thing, the resilient streaming protocol. So is that kind of what you've been touching on? That's exactly right. So our patented protocol, a protocol is just the way that you deliver the data uh, or package the data for transport. Uh, our patented protocol, the RSP resilient streaming protocol, is really kind of the secret sauce or the special ingredient um, that sets us apart from all the other streaming providers and allows us to have that type of resiliency to make sure that you have the highest quality and your broadcast is perfect. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and so kind of tied in with that, obviously you all have a line of like physical encoders. Um, and so talk me through the differences between them and kind of what their use cases are as far as that goes. So here are the different encoder models uh, that we offer. So uh, we have consumer grade hardware and server grade hardware. So the consumer grade would be the Ray series encoder. Uh, so that's built inside of an Intel Nook. Uh, which helped us lower the cost barrier of entry. So it's gonna look familiar to a lot of people uh, because we use the Nook to, to build it. Uh, but then we upgraded the components. And so this device is very portable. It's low cost, it's 1300. And then you just plug an SDI in. So you have power internet and your SDI broadcast and everything runs 
automatically. But then we have these Prism encoders. And so the Prism are A, they're server grade, right? So it's rack mounted hardware. You put it in a rack, it has the higher quality components like error checking RAM, dual NIC, server grade motherboard, et cetera. So typically if you're an organization that usually invests in server grade equipment, you would naturally lean this direction. The second reason you would lean towards these Prism encoders is they have a slightly higher quality for audio and video. Um, which is especially helpful if you're doing venue to venue streaming. If you're streaming not just to people's homes and your website, but you're streaming to actual physical locations where you're going to have a 24 foot screen or LED wall at that venue, then you want that higher crisper quality for those larger screens. And so the prisms produce that higher quality. And then the prisms can also ingest 4K. So this is more about future proofing. We don't necessarily stream 4K right now. But it's on the tip of everyone's tongue. When will streaming 4K be a thing? Um, you know, and when the, and when we are are able to stream, or when we do decide to stream 4K to the web, if everything else you own is 4K, like your cameras and your switcher, then you would want to invest in a 4K encoder as well. So you kind of mentioned this about venue to venue streaming. Um, I know that the Prism uh can handle that and then also you all have some other solutions that help with that as well right yeah exactly right so when you're streaming venue to venue you're looking at either the prism single channel for sending one channel to your other venues or campuses and then if you're using the dual channel you actually send a, a lot more uh uh you send a better aesthetic let me show you really quick what a dual channel may look like so if you're sending a dual channel stream now this this isn't a web benefit this is a venue to venue benefit so a dual channel stream is sending one channel, which is like your speaker with a head to toe across stage. And then the second channel you're sending is an iMag or a close up, right? So you're sending two simultaneous channels to your other locations. And then that way they can give this aesthetic with the side screens. So if you need to put up a slide for the audience, the speaker doesn't disappear from the stage. You could just put the slide up on the side screens instead. So that's the benefit of the, the dual channel encoder. And then there's the dual plus, which is really just that highest possible quality known to man. Uh, we want the most pristine video and audio possible. Then you're looking at the dual plus and you want to put that somewhere where it's away from your broadcast because it's quite loud um, while it's doing uh, its work. But when you're encoding for when you're encoding for web, you use an encoder to send the content to our cloud. And then our cloud sends it to Facebook, YouTube, your website, your apps, Roku, Apple TV, etc. When you're doing venue to venue streaming, it's similar. You have that encoder to the cloud with that first mile of resiliency we've talked about using that delay. But then at your receiving sites, you have what's called a decoder. And a decoder does the exact opposite, or it does the exact reverse. It downloads the data, but also checking for integrity, also re-correcting for any data loss during the download. So it downloads the data, and then it allows you to play it back in a DVR function. So something that was just live moments ago, you can now play back on demand at that campus or venue, but then because it's on demand and cached, you can pause it. You can pause that live video, switch to something local, like a song or, or an announcement, and then switch right back to where you left off. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Um, so talk to me a little bit about kind of the software side of things, like the web platform um, and kind of how that works. Yeah, so with the web platform uh, and the interface, so let's jump into the cloud here. So the dashboard uh, where everything is controlled, right? Your encoder is receiving the broadcast via SDI, most likely uh, it's got power, it's got internet, and then it's encoding it to our cloud. And here's where you manage everything from the cloud. It is 100% browser-based, so you can log in from anywhere. You don't have to be at the church. You don't have to be on site. You can be uh, at any location, configuring and managing the encoder and its behavior. And you can have logins for other people on your team. So for instance, many organizations have a leadership uh, login where they have the video review permissions only. So what that means is they can see everything but touch nothing, right? They can view all of the content that's being encoded. Uh, they can take notes and set cues so that you can read those notes in time, but then they don't have the burden of breaking anything or changing any settings. So let me go ahead and walk you through some of these tabs here. So from the dashboard, you're seeing what encoders you have and then what campuses you stream to. Uh, so this church is streaming to two of their other campuses currently um, via their encoders and decoders. 
uh, encoder tab. Once again, we're just looking at our encoders, what profile they're set to. We can see that this one is currently started, so we don't want to stop that encoder. Um, and what profile it's set to, it's set to 1080p. And so you would start up an encoder manually if someone forgot to tell you that there was an event happening in, in 20 minutes, right? And then you would set up your encoder. But normally, you're going to run everything on a schedule. And so this is one of the areas where our platform really shines. And a lot of people really find value here in the way that we've set up this schedule to be really simple, really user-friendly, but really powerful with how automated it is. So this organization does a live stream on Sunday mornings, and then they send it back out as a sim live Sunday night, and they send it as a sim live Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. So you can use our platform to do live content or simulated live content, and it's very simple. You can upload that recorded content, or you can play that 9 a.m. service right at 11. You can just send it back out without having to download and re-upload. So let me really quick show you what the scheduling tool looks like. Basically, from the scheduling tool, you're choosing your encoder, and you're telling the encoder every week until Christmas, I want you to turn on at 7 a.m. and stay on for nine hours. And so every Sunday, I want you to be on and be ready during this time frame without having someone to without someone having to press a button. And now I'm going to let you know when to expect content. So on Sunday at 9 a.m., you're going to get our first service, and that's going to start at nine. It's going to last an hour and a half or two hours. And I want you to send that service to our website, and I want you to send it to YouTube. Title, description, check. Facebook, title, description, check. No need for stream keys or anything like that. We're already connected to your mm -hmm. social via API. And then you can cross post to your multiple pages as well. If you have a youth page and a pastor's page, etc. And now just like that, you've created your 9 a.m. schedule. You'd hit done and do the same thing for 11, the same thing for six. And now everything is automated. The encoder knows when to turn on every week. It knows when you're going to give it service every week. It knows where to deliver service. You don't press play. You don't press stream. It all happens automatically. So minimizing the amount of buttons that need to be pushed, minimizing the amount of places where your volunteers have to have their eyes so they can focus on their production uh, and actually uh, enjoying the production aspect of things. So really advanced scheduling there. Um, we do 1080p uh, and stereo to Facebook and YouTube. And we're actually the largest faith load on Facebook. So Facebook let us know a couple months ago, no one streams more faith, con faith content to their platform than Resi, which is really incredible. Um, so connected to Facebook and YouTube via API, sending that 1080p. Uh, we also do transcoding. So when you send to Facebook and YouTube, they transcode it to different resolutions for your viewers so that they avoid buffering wheels. We do that same thing for the web platform. When you're streaming to your website, you can't predict the type of internet your user's gonna have, but we can accommodate all speeds of internet by giving you different resolutions to choose from automatically in the background, saving you from buffering wheels. Buffering wheels are bad. In case you guys didn't know, right. after the first buffering wheel, you're going to lose 27% of your audience. After the second buffering wheel, you're going to lose 70%. So people will drastically abandon your content if it buffers, if the quality is poor. Um, and then just a few other things here. Um, so here's an example of your embed code. This is what you put on your website so that your stream always shows up there. And then we have these stream URLs so that you can connect to Apple TV and Roku and your church apps. And we even have a standalone player um, that you can use. So this happened to an organization where their website went down, their social went down because of a copyright algorithm. And they were like, what do we do? What, where do we send people? And so they just sent people to their standalone web player, uh, which lives on Resi and you don't have to worry about going down. Uh, and then really the final stop would just be analytics. So seeing your viewership, right? How many people are watching from our stream? How long are they watching? What's their average watch time? Um, how, many, how many people watch longer than 30 minutes or less than 90 seconds? And what resolution did they watch at, right? So 144 people watching at 144 resolution, that's a low resolution. Some people may say, might say, well, that's that's a bummer. Uh, no, it's an awesome, it's a home run. It's an awesome thing because you save those people from having a buffering wheel. You can get through low resolution. You can't get through a buffering wheel. And then we give you geographical data as well. So a real-time breakdown of city, state, and country. Where are your viewers? Where's your presence strongest? So this is great actionable data. If you need to open up another campus or if you need to... Um, throw an event next year, but you don't know where, this is going to let you know where you have a strong presence, right? This is where your presence is strongest. And this is exactly how many people or IP addresses are watching from that location, 
right? And then now you're better informed for your next event or your next location that you need to open. And that's global data. So you can scale out and see that from a global perspective. Right, and then we also have an early warning system so we can send streaming alerts to your team if there's no internet going into the encoder, if there's no audio on channel two, anything blocking the signal path, and we can send an alert to your team, not just your team, but also our team. And because our organization was born out of a church, we understand that you need weekend support. Not only are you streaming most on the weekends, but you're using volunteers to accomplish your stream. They're gonna need help. They're gonna need someone who can help troubleshoot on the fly before service begins. And so we have a premier support team uh, that offers that help as well. And that's really it. It's a really simple interface. It's completely browser-based and you can have multiple people logging in for different roles. Yeah, that's awesome. That's very impressive. And I, like, I think the benefit that you have is it's so user-friendly and that you have so much control. Um, very easy to understand, but, but really powerful. Awesome. So as you can see, Kyle really knows what he's talking about and the stuff that Resi is doing is very impressive and we're really excited to incorporate it in a couple of churches uh, through our integrations department in the next couple months. Again, thanks so much for joining us today and if you wouldn't mind following us at IPS.live, we'll see you next time.